Hey everyone, thanks for being here. Nice to see you all for another special episode of Skane's Domain. Um, my name is Adam Meeks. I'm the video producer here at Gazette Lincoln Center. I'll be hosting tonight's event. Um, tonight, Winton Marsalis will be joined by a number of emerging young artists, including Emmanuel Wilkins, Cosimo Fabrizio, Alexa Tarantino, Riley Mullercar, Sean Mason, Joe Block, and Jacob Melcha. As is usual, I'll hand things off to Winton and our special guest for the evening. And then later on, we'll conclude with a Q&A portion. Um, I'll give instructions on how to ask a question once we get to that point for those of you who are unfamiliar and um, we'll get to that in a little bit. So uh, without further ado, take it away, Winton. I want to welcome you all again to Skane's Domain. It's such a pleasure for us to be here. And I'm really excited about tonight's program because I have the chance to speak of some of the most talented, engaging, uh, sincere, deeply soulful young people in the world. They're the reason that I'm always so optimistic about what is coming. Most of them I've had the pleasure of knowing since they were in high school, and I've seen them grow in so many ways. They are all great and dedicated musicians, and they're also political activists, they're music directors, they're teachers, they are recording artists, they're student body leaders, and they are much more. I've had many hours of good spirited conversation with them, and I always love hearing their opinions, and I always tell them you got to follow your young leadership too. You're gonna hear Cosmo Fabrizio, who's 19, Joe Block is 20, Jacob Melcher is 21, Sean Mason and Emmanuel Wilkins are both 22, Alexa Tarantino is 27. And we're going to start with our senior member, Mr. Riley Mulherka, who is 28 years old. He is a great trumpet player and he could always play. I first heard him when he was a freshman in high school or something like that. Uh, but with, with Riley, his humility and his adventurousness has resulted in continued improvement in his playing. Every time I hear this man, he is playing a different way and always with more depth and expressiveness. He also has a rare trait and quality to his solos because he plays with a great deal of thematic development. He plays with uncommon authority. I could go on and on, but he's a member of a group called the Westerlies, and he's also actively involved in presenting artists at festivals in North Carolina and New York City and Seattle. He's the artistic director of Joy in Aiken, a festival in Aiken, South Carolina. And I'm gonna turn it right over to him with this question, Riley, what has this pandemic and the quarantine made you realize with more urgency? Hmm. Thank you, Wynn. Hello, everybody. It's great to be here. Um, what has this pandemic made me think about with more urgency? It's hard sometimes because there's so much going on right now. Um, but I think one thing I've been thinking about, and I, I'll be curious to hear, everyone, all the panelists here, um, thinking about this together is that, uh, you know, we see how, how revealing a pandemic is in so many ways. Like we see it uh, on, a, on the level of government. It's very revealing. We see it um, as a society. It's very revealing. It reveals a lot about um, structural things, you know, uh, that may be working or, or very well may not be working as, as is the case. But I've been thinking about how it also has been revealing on a personal level. I know for myself, um, it's a very humbling experience to have to pause and to stop everything. And so much of what I do and what I think about can be measured by maybe how many gigs I have any given week or month or how much I'm traveling or how many people are in the audience, all, all these sort of factors that are actually more external. And then when you're forced to stop, um, it's made me think about with more urgency, what, it, what actually is it that I am um, working on and, and, where, and where am I going and what are my values, you know? Um, and I think that has, has, has been on my mind both on a personal level and, and on a musical level. Um, I'm looking right on the screen and I can see Sean Mason and one of the last gigs I played was in South Carolina at that festival with him. And I think we all have like the taste of the last game we played in our mouth, you know, because we're like hanging on to it as long as we can. Um, but I don't know. Uh, you know, I, I think for me personally, like it's no coincidence that I've been going back to a lot of the music that first got me into jazz, like a lot of Louis Armstrong and a lot of like Benny Goodman with Teddy Wilson, a lot of the records that got me really excited about music when I was really young. Um, and and that has like a lot of the books I've been reading are in similar boats. I'm, I'm you know I'm curious to maybe open up a little bit with uh, some of our other guests here about uh, 
what are the what are the things that you've come back to? What are the fundamental um, maybe things in a musical context, or just in a you know maybe as a citizen? I know we're going to get to some of those uh, topics a little later on. Sure, I could I could speak from a guitar perspective. Um, a lot of the work that a rhythm guitar player does is in the context of a band and your role is kind of measured around your contributions to other people, but there are no other people right now. Mm -hmm. So I'm forced to revisit a lot of Joe Pass, Joe Pass Virtuoso, trying to gain a greater appreciation for the guitar as an instrument in and of itself. Um, so yeah, Joe Pass Virtuoso. So I wanna, I wanna ask Riley a question. Uh, thank you, Cosimo. How do you deal with the fact that you can't make any bread? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a grim reality. Um, I mean, I mean, a lot of the time has been spent working on grants, working on applications for government assistance programs that to this date have not come through yet. And as the time goes by, it seems bleaker and bleaker. Um, but also, you know, looking out and trying to check in on people has been a, a big part of it. I was, you know, um, talking with Todd Stoll earlier today, who was in charge of education at Jazz Lincoln Center, and, and he was talking about a, a friend of his and, and a group of people had uh, bonded together to come up with some funds to support someone who was really living gig to gig at this moment. Um, for me, I'm lucky that I'm not gig to gig at this second right now, um, but yeah, it's been it, you know, uh, I don't I don't know I don't know what we can do right now besides try to figure out plans for the futures. Any any other? Uh, I just I want to. Yeah, I want to just just one thing before we before we go over to, to to Cosmos and hear what he's talking about. One other thing I just want to ask you is, when you return to those fundamentals, you return to the, the, what are you hearing in those fundamentals that makes you want to hear that? Because you also you have a lot of different styles of music you can play and write. Like, what do you find in those fundamentals? I I think I think it, for me it brings me back to how I fell in love with the music and, and, and the thing, the, the spirit and the feeling of jazz for me before all the other stuff came, you know, before yeah. moving to New York and studying music and before going on my first tour and then before getting to meet some of my heroes and play with them before, before all that happened, it brings me back to a focus and an urgency just on loving, loving music. And and um, and putting putting myself into it every day, um, and I think it's a recalibration so that whenever we can move forward out of this moment, uh, being able to maybe have checked in with that sense of ourselves um, in in a, in a deep way, you know, in a in a sort of meditative way. Um, I don't know if that resonates with. Some of, some of the other folks uh, here on the panel, like any moments that we might have had in the, in the past two months. Yeah, I can ask. Felt that. Yeah. I think, I think um, returning to these kinds of musics that we, we first fell in love with, let's just tap into that sort of innocence and that, that naivety that we had when we first started playing. But at the same time, returning to music that we may, maybe haven't checked out in a little bit, we have more maturity and we have more knowledge to apply to that music. So we, we can kind of reconcile a sort of, you know, youthful spirit that we get from it and, and also like an older, more mature listening, which I've, I've definitely benefited from in this quarantine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I feel similar to Riley um, in the way of kind of returning to these like kind of older, older things uh, that kind of made me fall in love with the music. And uh, one, one, one word that like kind of I found myself like kept kind of kept repeating was uh, retreat. Like I was always telling people like, man, I'm treating this time as like a retreat. You know what I mean? I'm like kind of just like by myself focusing on like development. You know what I mean? Um, and I think 
it's interesting because I've, I've thought about retreat in the way of kind of retreating back to traditional values and fundamentals in a way, but then also like actually retreating from, you know, society in a way, uh, as a way of development. So, uh, th this time in a way it's, it's all kind of for me about retreat in a way, you know, mm -hmm. I don't know. And I, that's great. Well, I, maybe I can pa pass it off now to, to Cosmo. Um, cause I know he's, he's going to take it in a direction, um, alongside what we can do when we're seeing all this going on on the societal levels, on the levels of government. When I was talking to Mr. Marsalis and, and some other people and Jacob a couple, a couple days ago, and the question that keeps on coming up is, well, what do you do? And I think part of the answer lies in, in the importance of reinforcing young people's idealism, not letting that wane, making sure that young people are staying on top of like what's going on in the news and finding a way to navigate for your own self spiritually what part of the news you're going to stay stay up to so that you don't get lost in it but most importantly that that idealism doesn't win curious to hear if other people you know feel in a similar kind of way about it well you know cosmo you mentioned that we had been working together a bit in the past several weeks um and something that i've been looking at recently that i've found so interesting is that everyone wants to say that our generation of 18 to mid 20 year olds they don't get out and vote um and for the most part that is true but something that's given me hope uh and given me a little bit of direction in all of this is that while our generation isn't always the best at making it to the polls we care overwhelmingly about issues and movements as opposed to political parties so i agree with you you're right i don't think that overwhelmingly in america that there is a huge sense of trust and faith in the government but it has been eye-opening to me to realize the extent to which our generation truly does care about these issues and movements, even if they aren't making it to the polls. And that's something that you and I are working together to improve as well. And I'll, I'll just say one thing then, to the point of music, one of the things that music has taught me is, um, particularly jazz, evolution is inherent to the art form. And I think this is an instance right now where we're seeing our political system can take a lesson from jazz in giving power to young people to move the ball forward um, at, a, at a fundamental level. Okay, let me, let me ask y'all a question. Okay, because I love all this giving to young people and all that, but you know, he, I don't, I don't want a 20 year old pilot on a plane that's struggling. <laughs> I'm already afraid of the airplane to begin with. So now I, I look up and there's a teenage up there. I'm, I might jump out the window to just, just not experience the next two minutes. So uh, what, what I want y'all, you, Jacob, uh, um, Jacob is a fantastic trombone player. And he is uh, from St. Louis and he's always been unbelievably civic, civic conscious. It's, it doesn't come out when we're just flowing back and forth if we don't introduce each other a certain way. But the two of y'all have been working on something to get younger people out to vote. Explain to us what it is that y'all are working on. Sure. Jacob and Cosimo. You got it, Kazi. Okay. You feel what I miss. Um, the project we're working on is, is largely like starting with at a high level kind of advertising around um, how, do, how do we craft messaging to real, make young people in this time see that voting is still a solution. As corrupt and as complicated and as difficult as our political system is, voting is still a tool that we can use effectively to inspire some sort of long-term substantive change. Um, one of the things that we started looking into even more is one of the, um, that in this election, there's going to be a need for young people to find a way to get, it, get involved outside of just like going to the polls. So trying to encourage people to stay focused on this like vote, vote by mail and voting at home, which in some states that are key for, for the election just generally, um, we're already seeing efforts to try to strip the vote and, and attack the integrity of American democracy by, by not allowing people to vote at home. Um, so we're trying to raise awareness, educate people about what is, what is going on, let people still feel confident in the fact that voting is a tool to in, impact change, and just broadly trying to help young people find their place in this chaotic election which hasn't even really started getting crazy yet. And it's, it's been great looking at ways that young people can get involved, aside from just making it to the ballot box, 
um, you know, we've been looking at ways and how we can encourage young people to sign up to work as, you know, election workers, poll workers, and looking at the different options that we would have in a vote by mail election or a vote in person election, depending on the outcome of coronavirus over the next few months. But finding ways for young people to really find that they have a place and have a voice in the political world outside of just you know, checking a box once every four years, really getting them involved and getting their boots on the ground, whether it be activism, voting, volunteering, what have you. I, I, I only wish we hearing them talk. I wish y'all could hear them play. <laughs> both, both of them are, are, are so for real. And I want to I wanna go over to, to a, a, a lady that's like a one woman wrecking crew. She started a, uh, a jazz festival in Rockport, Massachusetts, when she was only 22 years old. She's currently giving weekly concerts from home and she donates a portion of those proceeds to Artist Relief Fund. She's raised $3,000 so far. And because her summer program and many other programs have been canceled, she and a fellow teacher launched an online summer jazz program called A Step Ahead Summer. It's a jazz online for all ages and all abilities. And she is always uh, very insightful on, uh, on, on, on many, many issues. And we all rely on her. We're going to hear what she has to say. Ms. Alexa Tarantino, tell us something about how can, how can you use your talents and skills to be productive in a time to, to deal with the type of depression that Cosimo was talking about? Thank you, Winton. And thank you all so much. It's been great hearing you speak. Um, and it's so great to see so many friends and people watching. So hi to everyone. Um, yeah, during this quarantine, I have been just thinking about the impact of technology and social media and what we're dealing with, what we were dealing with before the quarantine, and how um, the impact that technology has on our lives has increased since we've all been on lockdown. Um, and one thing that I've noticed with um, technology and productivity is that this sense of urgency and instant gratification that we're getting from these notifications and emails and these pings and texts and the, the feeling that we have to respond right away is one of our biggest distractions from, from our main priorities and our main goals. And I read this book, Unsubscribe, by Jocelyn Glay, which I really recommend, which mentioned that anytime we're on a focused path of work and we depart even just to answer a text or an email, um, it can take us up to 25 minutes to get back on that same level of momentum and focus that we were on before. And I just, I'm kind of a nerd when it comes to efficiency and productivity. I read about this stuff all the time because um, I think as freelance musician, musicians, now more than ever, we are just having to maximize every single second, whether it's, you know, learning a set of chord changes on the airplane or like singing along to a record quickly before you get to the sound check, whatever it is. Um, I just try to make the most of every minute and I don't, I think the quarantine has provided a great opportunity to rest and retreat and retreat like Emmanuel said I've certainly done a little bit of that and I sometimes have to stop myself and allow myself to do that more but I think this question of how do we stay productive we really have to determine what our mission is and what our ideal work life balance is and then we have to commit to not letting the media and technology and social media dictate what we're thinking and what we want to do. So um, for me, I mean, and I, what I recommend for my students is, you know, writing down these priorities, breaking them down into actionable steps that you can take every day to move them forward. Um, but I think it also in this quarantine with us, with these musicians being so reliant on technology, um, like Winton said, I've been doing these weekly live stream concerts, there is an element of needing to depend on it at this time um, to make money or to, to give donations to people who need it. So I think the question that, that comes up is, um, do you let your music do the talking or do you have to do the talking for your music? And I think this is um, really what it is for us as jazz musicians right now. Um, and if I could just expand upon that, that question for a second, um, if you're doing the talking for your music, to me, that means you're playing, like without question, you get up on the bandstand and, and you let that do the talking. And for me, that's what I want people to think of me as a player, you know, that it all just comes out on the bandstand. Um, and, and that's, you know, really where it's all at. But, but in this time of having to do the, having to do the talking for your music, to me, that might mean 
more self-promotion, um, more communication with your audiences to engage them and maintain them through this time, coming up with initiatives to keep that community there and together. Um, so it's really interesting. And, and like Winton said, uh, quarantine concerts are, are a big thing right now among the community. And while we see jazz as this, you know, often an intimate and acoustic experience um, right now because we are dependent on technology, I guess I would just encourage everybody to keep their heads up and uh, make sure you are, you know, aware of what your priorities are, not letting social media and distractions take the reins, um, which hopefully can allow some room for people to find that creativity and inspiration to, to make something happen in the community with what we have. Okay, I want to I want to just ask you a question. Thank you. And I want to want to ask you a question based on what you were saying. When you to let your music do the talking for you. We now since the Great Depression, and the in the in the they covered most of the the thirties that the war took World War II took us up basically out of. We've not had substantial audio substantial music education for our general population. Mm -hmm. so we're looking at, you know, we're going to be up on a hundred years of that soon. Mm -hmm. Where so because we don't have audience appreciation for music in general, those art forms that require more education to enjoy, all the, all the years and study, you're playing basically for an audience that, through no fault of their own, have not been educated to listen to you play. So even if you're a great player, if you can't play at all, a lot of the audience, they might like you, they, your charisma, something you do, but they're not no longer able to evaluate what you're playing. Yeah. So this could be for you, Alexa, or anybody who wants to say, what do you do to stay encouraged when now you can't even be there in person? So your charisma is not, and you have a, an audience that's willing to listen to you play if we just had taught people to listen to music and have music appreciation classes, not for musicians, not like camps and things that we do. What, what do you, does this time make you think about the audience in a different way? Because the fact that we're on this phone makes me think about each of you, you all very differently than if we were sitting in my house. You know, now on my screen, I can see Sean. So, you know, I'm looking at it. Whereas if he was sitting here, you know, so does that, does that make sense what I'm asking? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, for me, with these, with these concerts, um, it's definitely been an adjustment not having the, the audience right there. And I think to a certain extent, you recognize how, you know, dependent you are on the applause or the cheers or the reaction or the laughs. Uh, like when in, in your banter. And so it's definitely uh, been an adjustment, but what I think the fundamental qualities of this music are, when you strip it down, come down to basic human qualities that hopefully everybody can understand. You know, it's not about notes and pitches and rhythms, and that's something that I try to identify in, in my music education is that um, jazz education in itself is a lesson in discipline, in time management, in respect, in responsibility, in listening, in empathy, uh, communication. And so I think during this time when people are, I mean, hopefully the, the audiences that we had are yearning for some type of connection and some type of entertainment. I think while we can't be there to have the same experience in person, um, I'm finding that the response from people is just overwhelmingly grateful because I think those qualities do come through, those qualities of this music in particular. Mm -hmm. So I wanna, I wanna hear what, uh, this next young man is a, is a composer and arranger student at Columbia and at Juilliard. And he is a philosopher and a poet. He has a very clear personal approach, play anything of the music from very complex music with all kinds of time changes on it, sophisticated to very, very basic fundamental music. Um, and I always love talking with him and hearing his perspective. And, and I wanna, and he's, he always, he's interesting because he has an overview and he has the ability to focus on the, the, the micro issues, which many times all of us who are composers know you have to do that. So you have to write a score, you have to think of all the form and all that. Then you have to go through and put a dot and a dash on notes and dynamics and make sure every chord is right in. So uh, he's 20 years old, his name is Joe Block. He's spoken a little bit already. Joe, what, what are you thinking about? Uh, about what Alexis is saying or what, you, what you're thinking about in general? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Wynn. Um, so I'm just thinking about the idea of responsibility and how we can be responsible for others, how we can care about people that aren't ourselves and that are potentially more vulnerable than us, which is 
definitely a important subject during this pandemic as we see this virus is hitting different demographic groups um, that you know don't necessarily pertain to us. And I'm, I'm noticing that during this pandemic, problems, you know, even though we're self-isolating, problems aren't going away. They're just, they're changing. They're, they're at the same time, they're becoming more local and they're becoming more general. Um, like the, the other day I was, I was transcribing some Herbie Hancock voicings from some comping he was doing. I was, I was really trying to get inside of the voicing and I was sending it to my friends and we couldn't figure out what the notes were. And it was, it, I was getting really frustrated and eventually we, we broke through um, and it was great. And in that same night, I found out that a family uh, friend had passed away. And in that moment, I, was, I, had, I had to reconcile two complete opposites. You know, the musical minutia, kind of what you're talking about with the dynamics, like what are these notes that he's playing? How can I get inside this music? Um, at the same time, you know, people are dying every single day. So, you know, every single day I'm thinking about what can I do as an artist and a musician and a, a pianist and a composer to help mitigate the, the gap between these micro and macro problems and, and, and create something that is more relatable for, uh, for the audience. Um, so, yeah, not, not just musicians are, are affected right now. The, as Lex said, the audience is also affected. The, uh, the experience of going to a performance and being next to strangers and sort of sharing in a collective, you know, experience of being overcome by something is gone. And, you know, you can sit in your living room and watch, watch a live stream, but that, that sort of camaraderie and, and, uh, you know, fellow feeling is, is completely gone. Mm -hmm. um, and with that, it's our empathy and our understanding become more fragile. And, you know, the oversaturation of technology leaves us, you know, numb and irritated and upset and even more self-interested. So these are all these problems that we're dealing with. And um, so, say something. As uh, as artists, we are here to you know help heal people, um, others, and ourselves. And and this is something that Witten does really well, and I really admire in his music. Is you include a combination of kind of personal and collective experiences in your music, um, so that you know others can more easily relate to what you're saying, um, improve themselves, and and feel something. And art has always been this kind of tool of, of consciousness raising and, you know, visually or sonically depicting su suffering in a group of, you know, a different group that isn't us. So the onus is on us now to, to really, really, you know, work on that sense of empathy and care for others that aren't ours. And, you know, how can we be, how can we be responsible for um, people that we don't even know, people that we see on the news that are suffering? And you know, this, relates, this relates to music when, when you're playing in the bandstand, when you're not playing, how can you be responsible for uplifting someone else's solo? You know, as, as a pianist, I have to comfort people. How can I really support and push someone in, in the same way that you know, someone would push me? So mm -hmm. these are just kind of like micro and macro things that I'm, I'm really, really thinking about. And I'm, I'm curious if anybody else has uh, any, any topics they wanna, you wanna touch on for this, this part. I want to point out how much is in, how much what you said is in common with uh with what Alexa is doing. It's touching the media. She's playing every day. She has to worry about bread. How she's going to take care of herself, and she's also donating a portion of the proceeds that she's online working to the Artist Relief Fund. And uh, I think you know to, to identify with what you're saying, uh, Joe. The the question you're a composer, you write music, and, and I think uh, if 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 I turn over to you. Your, your, your fellow brethren, your piano player, he's 22 years old, Sean Mason is his name. He's a dyed in the wool swinger, also imaginative and very passionate. And with, uh, he's very passionate, imaginative, plays a lot of intensity, but he doesn't forsake accuracy. So Riley was talking about a gig that they were on before, before we had the shutdown. So Sean, what are you thinking about, uh, about, about the, the uh, everything is gone in your, in your, in your social space? Like Joe, I thought it was t touching the way he said that you sit in a room with others and y'all have a collective experience. And what Alexa was saying, you're distracted and stuff going on and it takes you 25 minutes to get back to whatever it is you're doing. But I also want to let people know that we've been on our best behavior because we are public. Normally when I talk to them, oh my God, every, every time I say something, it's argue, 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 argue. <laughs> so I, I'm glad y'all have such good manners. I, I, I see something, I'm up to keep a, keep a spotlight on y'all every time we have a conversation. 
<laughs> so I want to just know, Sean, what are you what are you thinking about? You know, because you're in another place. All the social interaction has dropped away. Yeah, uh, I want to I want to start and 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 express how how grateful I am to be here and how grateful uh, it was to hear everybody speaking, also everybody in the comment section. Uh, we spend a lot of time complaining, uh, but I, I just wanted to, not tonight, but I just wanted to to, to express how, how grateful I am. And, uh, you know, and, and even even how bad technology is, I I just want to express how, how grateful we are to connect via technology and, and also to, to be able to live stream concerts. And uh, as as anything in life, we, we all have pros and cons, but I'm, I'm grateful for technology. A uh, hundred years ago, if this would have happened, who knows what, what position right. artists would, would, would be in. Uh, and so, I, but I do want to touch on kind of two, two, different, two different sides of a coin. Um, on one part is the, is the, is the gratitude that uh, personally keeps me lifted. But on the other side is, is that we, we can't be, we can't ignore the real issues that are going on. And, and to ignore the real issues is, is really to be ignorant. And uh, it's like we, we, we walk around life with invisible layers of, of armor and that as musicians, we've accumulated over the years. And the virus proves us that overnight, the, those pieces of armor can, can be taken away from us. And uh, we, have to, we have to resort to, to what is constant and um, Riley touched on it in his first speech is going back and, and, and Emmanuel touched on it too, but going back to the, to the original motive, to the, to the original incentive that, that started us all on this journey of, of being an artist and, and being a musician and, and not taking for granted any opportunity. Uh, I've learned that I'm, I'm not entitled to anything. I'm, I'm grateful to be able to, to play <laughs> gig for, for money. I'm not, I'm even, even after the coronavirus, I'm not entitled to have those gigs back. It's a, it's a, <laughs> right. uh -huh. no, I'm, I'm grateful for every gig that I have. And, uh, I, I don't take that lightly. So I, I, I do want to touch on the, the, the second side of the coin, uh, which is the, the incentives and the, and the incentives that, that drive our social life that drive our political life and ultimately that, that drive our lives as, as artists seeking whatever we're seeking. Um, we, it's, it's, it's the question of, of us always trying to define something. And once we, we get to the moment where we have to define something, we have to ask the question, who are we or what are we doing? And the, the virus has, has proved to us that if, if the money can be easily taken away from us, if the audience in person can easily be taken taken away from us, something has to be constant, and we have to be we have to hold on to what is constant. And uh, and you know my views on it is, is that the music is was the music lives beyond me. If I were to die, the music continues to live. I'm just a vessel. I'm I'm just a part of this this whole thing, uh, and and I'm I'm here to to portray my voice and to, and to give my part. Into, into the whole continuum of, of, of the thing. And so I'm, I'm, just, I'm just super grateful. And I wanted to, to put that message of positivity into the conversation of gratitude and also of spirit and uplifting spirit as artists. And, and for us to, to go back and hold on to, to what first started us as artists and to not take anything for granted, even, even in this tough time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was, a lot, there was a lot that was beautiful in that. What you said, and it's, it's also encapsulating a lot of what everybody is saying in terms of the, to have the type of humility, to have the type of understanding. And I think what, what Joe said, I think when he said people other than us are, are not, not our people, he was talking about anybody that's not your immediate family or anybody. So he was talking about anybody you perceive as being the other. And I think, Sean, you know, you, you, you were talking about, <laughs> it made me laugh when you say we're not entitled to nothing, even after this is over. And that the, the stripping away makes us makes us get down to the fundamentals, and that uh that that, that fundamental is the music. I was thinking about the, that Victor Frankl's book, Man Search for Meaning, where he was in the concentration camps, and he would see really strong people would be broken down in three weeks. They was they weren't big; they was skinny, and he realized that the only thing that can't be taken from you is how you feel about something. That you know you take everything from me, but you can't make me like that you do. 
And it's kind of when you were saying the music is a constant, it made me think about that stream that we all are in. The music is what has us all here. And my, my only wish, uh, because of the, the limitation of this form, is where we in a room and everybody could hear you all play and hear how high the level of playing is and how serious the playing is, a lot would be made clear. So it, it ties in with what Alexa was saying about speaking about your music. You can speak, but when you play, you don't have to do too much talk. And uh, I want to I wanna go, from, go from, uh, from Sean. I want to see what Jacob is saying and let him riff on something. Uh, Jacob is 21 years old. And uh, he spoke already, but he's, he's going to speak and clarify things. He's also another family of musicians can just, just can play his horn. Uh, you, you can just, if you want to riff on what we, we did, you can, Jacob, or just take it where you want to take it. And then, you know, I know Emmanuel is going to break something down too, so. Well, yeah, I just wanted to, to touch on a couple of things that both Alexa and Joe mentioned. Um, and it's, it's that looking at our music beyond just the surface level of the notes, rhythms, and pitches, what about that music draws us in and how can we utilize this time that we're in to create meaningful art? If you look at musical works from history, we, they, why have they had a lasting impact on society and why or why not were they received well? Uh, they often play on themes that are central to our nature as humans, feelings and emotion that we all feel. Much of today's pop music revolves around heartbreak, lust, and greed. And there's a reason that that music is popular because everyone has been through a breakup or wanted something really badly. People resonate with those themes as they have throughout all of human history. On a deeper level, much of the music of the past that still resonates with us today revolves around themes of loss, oppression, struggle, and unity, and all forms of music deal with this to some degree. From the work songs of slaves on plantations in the Deep South to the music of post-World War America in the 1940s, music has always come from these deeply rooted feelings and served to bring us together in times of distress and peril. Singers like Nina Simone found herself in the heat of the civil rights movement, acting as both a musician and as an activist, performing songs like Backlash Blues, where she sings, you give me second class houses and second class schools, do you think that all colored folks are just second class fools? or songs like I Wish I Knew How It Would Feel to Be Free, where she cries, I wish I could break all of the chains holding me, remove all of the bars that keep us apart. Now, obviously Nina's music made some people feel wildly uncomfortable, but her high profile performances of this music allowed her to play a crucial role in the civil rights movement, and her music remains impactful today because it harbored those themes of oppression and the struggle for equality. Impactful music also came out of, the, out of wars of our history. World War II coincided with the big band swing era, where soldiers, uh, where songs played into the themes of the soldiers coming home or fighting for common victory. And a few decades later, John Lennon wrote songs like Power to the People, where he says, a million workers working for nothing, you'd better give them what they really own, calling for unity and class solidarity as the U.S. came out of the radical politics of the 60s. The song was used as a rallying cry by pro-democracy students in the early 70s to protest America's military campaign in Vietnam. And even today, uh, with as divided as we all stand at times, popular music can put a spotlight on inequality and oppression and bring it to the world stage. Kendrick Lamar's music has highlighted issues of police brutality and mass incarceration that have ravaged our country for decades and still do so. Through highlighting the struggles that so many African Americans face, he consequentially unites people, his music bringing them together in the face of their challenges. So what role does coronavirus play in the continuum of time in this music? Obviously, it isn't necessarily comparable to a world war, a civil rights movement, or mass incarceration, but tens of thousands of people have died here in the United States to date alone. Tens of millions of people have filed for unemployment. The majority of the human race, which are very social creatures, are now stuck in solitude for a matter of months upon months. Most of us as musicians haven't made music with a real person in a couple of months, which goes against the very essence of what jazz is as a social and interactive music. What emotions does this global crisis make us feel as humans? And can we channel those into meaningful art in this time? Will the impact, or will the music of coronavirus have a lasting impact on society? If we as artists, not just as musicians, but as artists can tune into those common themes of loss, struggle, and isolation that the entire human race is dealing with, we can create art that is relatable on a deeper level. And hopefully, as an artistic community, we can come together in the aftermath of this pandemic and reflect upon the art that came out of these modern day struggles. 
Okay. Well, my question, and it's for you, but it's for all of y'all. Are y'all doing that? Are y'all trying to do that? Or y'all just are y'all just talking about it? Me personally, um, I've had a rough time coming up with inspiration specifically out of coronavirus. But as a jazz musician who's going to school to study this, I have also been trying to figure out different ways that I can combine my art with my passion for, as you mentioned, politics and social justice. And so I personally, even if not yet coronavirus specific, I've tried to kind of mesh my art with my passion for those things and use my art to bring attention to social issues like, like, like inequality, mm. um, social justice, what have you. And so even if it's not coronavirus specific yet, I've been trying to do that in a general sense. What about some of our other, other and I, I mean, you always have been like that. So I understand you had your, your kind of social consciousness as a very young person, which is uncommon. Uh, somebody else, just if we could unmute people, I just want to want to hear just a, a different before we get to Emmanuel, uh, or if, if he wants to say it, just what what are y'all specifically going to do uh, in this time? What have you said? I'm going to create this. I'm going to be on this kind of vibe. Well, I mean, yeah, I, I can I can talk about it a little bit. For me, uh, that's been that's been kind of an ongoing question for me is uh, kind of how you know how how are how how does the music look during this and uh, like how can we bring this to people? during this time um and i mean right now i mean one one of the immediate things that uh, i did and probably a lot of my friends did was immediately bought a microphone it was like all right well mm. we at least we, we got to be able to learn how to track and <laughs> you know what i mean do something right. um but then uh in in planning i'm i'm i'm, pl I'm planning a uh, a festival for once this is over um and i'm working working with this uh this organization called the metropolis ensemble and uh, what they're what they're talking about is, man, like, well, what what do concerts look like after this? Social distancing, all of this, in terms of uh, putting the, you know, putting the society back together again. Uh, you know, we're forced to deal with. Well, uh, there's a different set of parameters on what music looks like, what live music looks like in those times, uh, and especially, I mean, thinking about now. Uh, I mean, I, I get up, I'll tell you, I get up every morning and I, I work out, right? And I listen, I listen to music on my headphones and uh, me and some, some friends in a band that we have, uh, we, send, we send a record every week. Uh, so it turns out to be four records every week and we all listen to those four records, right? Uh, and what it, what it got me reflecting on was the fact that just recorded music affects me in a completely different way than when I listen to music live. And how do we figure out how to replicate that energy? If, if there's a way to replicate that energy while separated, you know, how do we, you know, how do we, how do we deal with that? Uh, right. So these are some things that I've been thinking about and uh, just kind of reflecting on during this time, I guess, mm -hmm. you know. Well, I know, you know, Emmanuel, Emmanuel is 22 years old and he's, he also plays with, a, with tremendous sophistication and he has fantastic ears. I know, I know you got perfect pitch. You always try to play it off, but <laughs> and he, uh, he, his music also is very intense because he he plays with a great deal of meaning and and belief. So uh, I think if anybody can figure that out, because like, you know, I'm trying to just figure out how to get my cell phone on. I can't even look down at most of the icons. I, when I look at it, I have to call somebody and say, "What does this one say right here?" So if you can figure out how to make this experience of where we are be more impactful. And and the depth of of uh, yeah, with 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 the depth, you will have done something. I wonder, you know? man. I see. I wonder if uh, like the tradition of house concerts is gonna come back after this. You know what I mean? I wonder if people will start playing house concerts again. You know? Yeah. I, I mean, I I would try. I I like that. I mean, one thing I always think about. I think we were in this time in general where, it's, as as especially as young musicians, a lot of times we have to make our own gigs. Mm -hmm. You know, the gigs, no one's calling you, asking you, uh, you know, to line up a, a tour across the country. That's just not a reality. Um, and, and, I, and I think we'll, we'll see more of that where it's, it's up to us to create the, create the environments to create the gigs, um, as I think was the trend anyways. But I think it's only accelerated to that point even more. Yeah, I agree. I think, I mean, I think if, if you want to have a 
uh, I guess, varied or well-rounded or long-lasting um, career. In my opinion, like playing in any different style, any any different era, um, you know, any different influential musician on your instrument, all those tools and things you put in your toolbox. But at the end of the day, I, I completely agree that like making your own career with all of that, making your own work is where it's at. So like when Sean was saying, we're not entitled to anything, that's, I'm totally with you. And you have to, I feel like now more than ever, we have to find our niche. And so if right now it's online concerts for, with a very particular specific sound of, you know, maybe somebody just wants to hear Blossom Deary and there's like a whole community of people that just want to hear Blossom Deary tunes. Like if that's the live stream concert that's hot right now, like that's the bread that's coming in, you know? So I think in this time, um, now more than ever, making your own work is what it's about. You know, what you, what you saying about that, Sean? Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, just just to piggyback on on what every what everybody else said, I, I think, I think that as far as a, a music career happens, I mean, my my personal philosophy of it is, is that, with with especially relating to the coronavirus and even going back to, to what what Jacob said about how he's responding to the coronavirus, uh, for me, it it didn't affect my creativity in the way that I thought it was going to affect my creativity. And so I thought that it was going to kind of put a pause in my creativity, put a pause on my life and, and allow me to, to reflect and, re and reevaluate some things. But I think that the inherent, the inherent truth and the inherent, inherent uh, reason why I play is, is way deeper than anything that can be affected, whether it's coronavirus or, a critique you get from other musicians or whatever that may be. And I think that ties directly into our career decisions and the decisions that we make in this time of how we're going to, to quote unquote monetize our career and how we're going to reach an audience. So I want to, I want to just ask Emmanuel, because I know he, he, he comes from Philly. He has that same kind of consciousness. Him and Joe are both Philly. Really? So like they're good at talking about cheesesteaks. Yes, sir. <laughs> but I want to, I want to, I want to see what it meant because he, he, he also has another con consciousness. You know, he, he has, a, he's, he's always about kind of consciousness and the spirituality and music. When you see all the non-spiritual stuff that's going on on the macro level, and all the decisions that are made that are so, uh, so non non caring from a humane standpoint, and how all the aspects of our culture that, that have to do with investment. Like education is an investment in the future of people. A health system is a, is a, is a, your healthcare is an investment in the future of your, your, of your, of your, your, your way of life. When we come to this aspect of our lives, we're always impoverished when it comes to that. Because everything is always about exploiting everything for every damn dollar you can squeeze out of. So when somebody like you sees that, and you're looking around, you don't have no gigs, you can't make money, you're calling your boys, you're listening to recordings. What, what, how is that, what does that do to your, is it making you waver philosophically? Because sometimes, you know, hunger gives you a very different attitude. <laughs> yeah, I'm, uh, definitely. I, I think, I mean, uh, just when, when I think about how, how I grew up and, um, just, I, I mean, I, I could, I could speak for a lot of us. I'm, I'm sure. Uh, when I think about just what is fundamental to our, to our lives in general, and music, music is, is what we fall back on. And uh, in a way, that I mean, that's what it's always been for me. It's, it's never, uh, you know, it's, it's always about, you know, how can I respond to this more or less than uh, doing something different. Even I'm, I'm doing the same thing as I was always doing. It's just a for me, it was a different. It's a different medium, you know. I'm, I'm pre presenting the same thing, and I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to heal people. I'm trying to, I'm trying to right. you know, uh, provide some comfort and and some love, you know. So has the extreme circumstance made you double down with your thing, or has it made you you doubling down, or you are you which, which, what's your what's your attitude? I'm, I, yeah, I'm, I'm doubling down. I'd say, I'd say, I, I'd say, I'm doubling down on it. Uh, yeah, I'm. I'm just. I'm going harder. You know, I got more time. Got more time. 
I mean. What you saying, Cosmo? You doubling down or you you backing away? I'm doubling down too. I can't back away. I think um, one of the things that I respect about um, Emmanuel that is a little different is for me, music, music, um, music, like, like Emmanuel said, plays such an important role in my life, but it's not, it's not like my, my sole career. And I'm still before coronavirus as a young musician, trying to figure out exactly um, how music plays a role in my life because I, I, I didn't go to conservatory like my brother and like a lot of people I grew up playing with, but knowing that my life without music is, is inherently less meaningful. So coronavirus has made me appreciate that, that facet of it. And like Emmanuel and a lot of people are saying, I've been spending a lot more time playing, not because I have to, it's honestly been better that I don't have to play for something because I've been finding that intrinsically when I don't have it for a certain amount of time, like I just start feeling lost. So. Mm -hmm. So I want to ask, I want to ask Alexa, just what about music without words? Every time we, we talk about social consciousness, it's always got to have a word att att attached to it. What about music? People, we, we, most of us are instrumental musicians. I mean, we, we, we love the song word. We love, I'm not, it's not against singing, but for some reason when, in, the, in the last, I noticed in the, in the last years, Whenever a music is described the social consciousness or social meaning, it's always music with words. Is is there a modern music that younger people are playing that is a music without words that has that same kind of feeling of 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 protest on one hand, but affirmation on the other hand? Because many times what we call protest is actually people trying to affirm the equality that is that you are promised an opportunity to pursue by the Constitution. Now, it's not in there, but you're promised the opportunity to pursue it. So is it possible for you all to play horns or pianos and guitars and, and, and alto, because Alexa plays alto saxophone. I don't know if I said that, but when she plays all the reeds, flute, she probably play a good baritone tenor, it doesn't matter. But what do you think about that? Yeah, I think, I mean, it's <laughs> feels like a trick question because this is what you're always telling me, like <laughs> off stage, which is, you know, getting all the colors into your horn and um, being able to express all those different attitudes and emotions. But it's, it's real. I think I remember um, I played one gig with the Jazz Lincoln Center Orchestra at the Kimmel Center and afterwards um, went and came back to where I was in the, in the backstage area and was talking about um, Ornette and just the amount of emotion <sighs> and raw uh, feeling in, in, in his sound. And so, I personally, I love to listen to vocalists, um, but I, as a saxophone and a woodwind doubler, like I think that's with the, ex with the expansive options in terms of flutes and clarinets and double reeds, like that's where I choose to pick my feelings, if that, if that makes sense. Um, like, you know, the, 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 the personality that comes from the alto flute is so different from the personality that comes from a bassoon or a tenor or a soprano, and then I think within each instrument when you're playing it, um, the goal like Winton has taught me and I know many of us is um, to sound like you are a human being, um, crying or moaning or you know shouting for joy, expressing joy. Um, I don't think words need to be attached for somebody to, to empathize with, with a cry or, or that raw human emotion. What, what, do you, what do you think, Joe, you a composer? Like in terms of when you write music, do you feel like the human voice? Uh, I'm not to go away from what what Alexis is saying. I, I understood what you what you were saying, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but I mean the type of force that a person plays their instrumental music with, yeah. that they're with. Like I, the person who comes, of course, most immediately to, to mind is Train. Yeah, just because yeah. you know Train, his sound was so characteristic and equated with the civil rights movement. Right, uh, and, and and he didn't do like Mingus would. You know, had fables of fathers with talking or, uh, right. I think most people probably go come up there with Train and, and Elvin. Totally. It seems like that's not really a, a of the younger younger generation. Because you know, one thing I want to make clear for is I, I don't I, I don't I encourage my younger people to I, you you should have the opinion you want, the attitude you want. This is your ride out here. You don't have to agree with me. You you need to be free and be forceful with what you think because you got a certain amount of time, and your artistry is going to demand from you absolute honesty with yourself. And don't be swayed by mentors and people. Learn from them. Listen to them. Okay, that's your opinion. 
But when it comes time to make your statement, you know, so I want you to talk to me the way you talk to me when you texted me back and forth. You know, what, 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 what are you, are you thinking about that kind of vibration? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I definitely feel you on the, the Coltrane thing. I've, I feel like Emmanuel can back me up. The train sound is such a part of Philly, Philly jazz. Here we go. Uh, <laughs> train is from train is from North Carolina, man. He, yeah, he's from I mean, Philly. He, he's from Philly. <laughs> he moved here. He moved here when he was twelve or thirteen. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I've been listening to a lot of a lot of McCoy and Train, and that sort of intensity and, and energy is, is unparalleled, I think, in, in in the history of of jazz, in my opinion. That's just insane amount of emotion, the raw emotion. So you can go down that route of sort of tapping into our kind of core human elements. Um, but to address your thing about words, I mean, there's also a history of, of a sonic representation of the issues that we're dealing with, you know, whether it's, it's a harmonic progression or it's, uh, you know, when you've, you've written a lot of music that kind of uh, offers, you know, the sonic representations of, of trains or, or objects or different things that, you know, people can hear like, okay, that sounds like this, that sounds like this. And you, while it might not be a, a word or a phrase, that's sort of a, a common uh, symbol that we can tap into. So I think, I think when, I, when I play, when I write music, I try to do a balance of both, of you know, tapping into both the human, the human element, which everyone relates to, and sort of, and at the same time, the sort of social and cultural symbols that we can represent sonically. Mm -hmm. and if I, if I could say something to that, I, I think that uh, one of the interesting things about what we do as, as musicians is we provide the soundtrack for, uh, for decades of music. You know, if you think about the 50s, you're thinking about, a, you know, a certain group of people. If you think about the 60s, you're thinking about a certain group of musicians. If you think about the you know what I mean? Like, so uh, what, what, gets, what gets created during this time, uh, non-vocally or, or vocally, whatever, um, I think it's, it's, it's interesting because our, our role in a way is to kind of provide the soundtrack of this era. You know, when I think about the Great Dep Depression, I do, I think of Lester Young, you know what I mean? I think of his playing. Uh, so, you know, or if you, you know, I, I just, I, I've been reflecting on kind of the ideas of uh, just like audible association, you know what I mean? When I think about going to a cookout, like I'm thinking about, you know, like earth, wind and fire, you know what I mean? It's like, like certain associations for me. Uh, and so I'm, I'm interested to see, you know, what, uh, what's going to be the product of uh, what's going on right now, just in terms of the soundtrack of this generation, you know, because that's because these, like all of us on this call right now are, you know, we're, we're going to be the, the main, main uh, cats plan, I guess, in creating this music. So this kind of, shapes our generation sound in a way you know uh no pressure <laughs> yeah you know but it's, it's so it's it's so many people playing around the world that you don't know that you're gonna meet yeah yeah but no, totally. you know you're gonna meet people man you're gonna be they're gonna be from places you never even heard of i remember when i first met ego bootman i was 26 or something somebody from russia man could play like that damn man how you learn how to play like that <laughs> chano dominguez man we were in some jam session in, in spain he stopped playing up. Man, where are you from? You know, the list it gets, it goes on and on. And believe me, it's it's people out there you don't know. Them. Uh, yeah, that's true. So, uh, yeah, I understand what you what, what what you're saying. Sometimes I wonder you take a person like Duke Ellington who wrote music during the jazz age, during the during the Great Depression, the swing era through World War II, music of the 1950s, wrote all those suites in the 1960s, and then had a little tail off in the 70s a figure that's so, so large across the whole expanse of American music that his achievement is not even dealt with. It's mm -hmm. kind of like Bill Russell with those 11 championship rings that he won. He's always left out of every conversation of who's great. The greatest player in the history of all team sports, not even mentioned. It's like, he didn't, he didn't I said, how can a guy win 11 championships, the last two player coach, and his name is never brought up? I don't, it's something I don't, I can't understand it, man. So, you know what I mean? So, okay, a decade, and I agree with you, stuff falls in the decades. Like a guy like on that Coleman is equated with the 60s. But he was playing, you know, he played the whole time. You know what I'm saying? 
So we're gonna we're gonna go to I see Emmanuel didn't like that. So we're gonna go to questions. <laughs> we go. We, we, what's that, we, where are we at, Adam? Let's let's get some people's questions. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we've got a we got a, a lineup of questions, and for for those of you who, who would like to ask a question, just um, click raise raise hand on the participants tab, and we'll I'll start going through them and see how many we can get to. Um, yeah, and I'll just go I'll ahead. throw it to different of our young people, you know, based on what it is. Great. So I'll, I think we got about um, fifteen minutes worth of questions. So let's just see what we can get through here. Let's see if we um, can get everybody in on one. Great. First up, we've got a question from Abigail Cole. Abigail, go ahead. Hi. Um. So before, um, you were talking about how um right now education is a very big and important part during these times. So I was wondering, um, who were some of your great teachers, and what aspects made them such prominent people in your life? And along with this, what important life lessons did they teach you? Ooh. You want to hear from the old guy? You want to hear from young people? Anyone. <laughs> Okay, well, I'm, I don't let uh, Riley can do it, but don't don't include me if I'm one of your teachers. Don't put me in. <laughs> oh, you're just, gonna, you're just gonna presume oh. that you would have been. <laughs> no, I mean, hey, I said if. I didn't presume. I said if. <laughs> um, thank you, thank you, Abigail. You know, one of the. I'm thinking of a couple things, and I'll try to organize it in a way that makes sense. But I've been thinking about education also because. I think this situation has been affecting us as a jazz community, particularly in a hard way because jazz is so much about generations. And so, so many of the people who were my teachers and my mentors who showed me, uh, who helped me fall in love with all of this um, are the ones who are so vulnerable um, right now. I was just on the phone with my middle school director, Bob Nat in Seattle, I went to Grambling State. His, I, and also the generations of jazz are, are so, you know, this music is so young. His uh, father used to hear Bunk Johnson practicing in Louisiana, and he would tell me about that, and I was in middle school. So, anyways, to, to, your, to your question, um, what he gave me, what my high school director, Clarence Acox in Seattle, Washington, what he gave me, um, and then some of the other mentors I had in Seattle, guys like Wayne Horvitz, um, and Robin Holcomb, great composer and pianist. Um, what they gave me was more than any lessons I can remember, they gave me a feeling of the, the spirit of what they loved about music and what they loved about jazz and, and what it could give. And they imparted that on me. And I have to say, it's one of the things that in this time I've been optimistic about. You know, I have some students and some teaching things that had, had been lined up and I was trying to think, okay, well, how can I make this work if I can't be there? Um, but actually imparting the spirit and the love of this music and all the things that make me like get up and scream because this music gives it to us, like I can still do that. And I can still um, share my favorite recordings, the recordings that help me fall in love with the music um, and, you know, communicate with younger generations and all that. So, um, yeah, I mean, for me, in terms of my teachers, it was it was more about the spirit of the thing mm -hmm. than anything. And then that's what made me fall in love with it. And I'm still, you know, still falling in love. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. What else we got, Adam? Great, Riley. Thank you. All right. Thanks for your question, Abigail. Um, all right. Next question is from Sean Pendiri. Mm. <laughs> Go ahead. Get him off of here. <laughs> What's up, Sean? <laughs> What's up, Sean? Hey, how are you doing? Uh, first thing, Mr. Sauce, I wanted to express my condolences. My family all sends their love. We found your words really inspiring, so thank you for that. Man, just seeing you lifted me up. Thank you, man. <laughs> thank you. I'm serious. I love you. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to throw this out for all the students in the in the call. I wanted to ask you guys how. Um, this situation is kind of affecting the way you guys are approaching your education and a lot of you are still in college and I don't know I just thinking about how to be a musician in music school when you can't play with people is something very interesting it's a really hard task and I want to know how you guys are kind of dealing with that 
And uh, lastly, I just wanted to say, Emmanuel, you sounded so great on Gifton's album, and I just had to shout that out. So, <laughs> also happy birthday, Ron Carter. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, you want to, Jacob, you want to, it's got to be somebody still in school, so. Sure, yeah. Uh, so for me, you know, finishing up my junior year at Juilliard on Zoom has been quite interesting. Um, and it's, it's taken away some of the elements of what makes music school, in particularly Juilliard, so, so incredible. Getting to play with some of the most talented young musicians and artists on the planet and being surrounded by such incredible faculty. It's kind of stripped some of that away uh, in an in-person sense. And so what I've found has been really useful of, of useful ways to spend my time now is kind of diving into jazz from a different perspective other than just playing it with people. Because there's not really a way that we can do that. You know, We can make acapellas or layer tracks on GarageBand, but it's not going to be that in-time, in-person collaboration that we're so used to. And so reading about jazz or studying the history of jazz or learning how to write tunes better, you have to kind of focus on different non-collaborative aspects of it to a certain extent. So I've really found that, you know, just diving into to certain biographies or movies, uh, documentaries about jazz, learning how to write better for my teachers has been really useful in this time where we can't really play with other people real time. Okay, I just want to want to say thank you, Jacob. Sean is a is a great bass player and a great one of the greatest people you will ever meet. And he's talking about a trumpet player named Gifton Jellum, fantastic young trumpet player. Who Gifton can just play. And uh, Emmanuel is on Gifton's fantastic album. Great, great right, Sean. Happy birthday, Ron Carter. Thank you so much, guys. Thanks, yes, Sean. Bro. Do, 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 do. Stay on that. Stay on that bass. <laughs> All right, let's take another question. We've got one from Estevan Otero. Estevan, go ahead. Estevan, you there? All right, I'm going to go ahead and, and, and move on, if not. Um, let's try one from Nick Beltramini. Nick, go ahead. Hey y'all, I'm gonna throw it back to education for a sec. And you were talking about using this time for education. And I think as a whole, you know, music education is vital for just everyone to have a fundamental understanding. And I think so often I see so many listeners just not being able to appreciate or like truly listen to the music. Just cause, you know, to be honest, a lot of people don't know that there's 12 notes on the piano. And I just think, Now's a great opportunity as a whole to focus on music education. But I'm curious from the musician, like an individual musician perspective, what can we do? Uh, is it change the way we approach the music or the way we communicate to listeners to make it more, I guess, accessible to the general public? You wanna, Sean, you wanna answer that? Because you kind of touched on that, what you, what you think about your music or if, if not, you you want to answer? Um, I can. I mean, I I think Alexa might be best suited for for the education because how involved she is. But I I can answer it if you if you, if you want me to. Well, we we can we can let her do it, and you can wait for one that's you know. That's okay, go Sean. You got it. Okay. okay. Um, <laughs> I mean, I can take it. Come on. Let's... You have all these organizations. To no, I mean it's not about organizations though. I think it's about about. Uh... I okay okay all right all right okay so <laughs> here we go um, now it's getting closer to what it is that's, that's good. what I was about to say this is I know yeah. <laughs> getting like forty I know forty five minutes in right um so yeah I mean it's it, that's a great question I think um you know my parents are not musicians and so when I said I wanted to be a jazz saxophonist it was totally out of the blue and I knew like in fourth grade that I wanted to be a saxophonist um and so my dad. Um, is in medicine, and I think he went out and bought all those books, you know, just about jazz and how to listen to jazz and all this stuff. And um, I think I'm taking your question less in like the education, you know, organizational education perspective and more just um, how to inspire people to be curious about the music because I think maybe the attitude that I'm sensing, like what you're talking about, is maybe somebody has an attitude like, I don't understand this, therefore I don't like it. And 
um, that's just shutting something down that's unfamiliar, right? Uh, so in my opinion, I think it's just, it's um, teaching people to be open to something which you don't, you know, it doesn't have to be music in this situation, um, but it's teaching people that unfamiliar is not bad or wrong. And that's, again, a fundamental issue that we have in society. Another thing I want to just add to what Alexa was saying, one of the implications in your thing was, should you play like how people want you to play? Well, that's like, should you act like how they want you to act in your neighborhood? Right. Should, you, right. should you change your attitude? Should you go along with the, whatever is the, with the popular viewpoint? I'm gonna go to just something that I would tell Emmanuel. It doesn't make a difference how many times I tell Emmanuel something, he's gonna do what he wants to do. I say, Emmanuel, so you say, yeah, yeah, man, I understand what you're saying. And he doesn't know. He thinks, I really want to hug him for that. Because you have to have a personal vision that's so strong and you have to be so, have such deep belief in what you're doing that, hey, okay, you don't like this. This is what I play. And if you play that with enough force and feeling like he does, then, then people come around to it. So I have to tell him, I was wrong, man. You do your thing, man. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for your question, Nick. <clears throat> All right, let's go to another one. We've got um, Jennifer Thylacker. Yes. Great, Jennifer, go ahead. Hi, thank you so much for taking my um, question. This is for Mr. Marsalis. Um, I've had the pleasure of meeting you several times. I've brought my students to everything. Central Ellington, rehearsals. We were at the Sesame Street rehearsal a couple months ago. Uh, my question is, how would you motivate and inspire, and this could be for anybody, but actually Mr. Marsalis, I'd like you, you to talk on it as well. As a music teacher in Harlem, how would you inspire and motivate students during this pandemic through Google and Zoom? I'm, I'm feeling the disconnect. I've tried to reach out and talk to the kids. I have them on smart music. The kids who have instruments, half don't. I find myself getting really um, discouraged. Well, I'm sorry about that. You know, and I understand. Uh, being in a lot of classrooms, a lot of times, uh, you know, p people don't, don't, don't it, it's, it's hard to perceive with, the, with, with, with kids. How old are the kids that you're teaching? I teach middle school, fifth through eighth, and I felt like um, we were just on the cusp <laughs> of, I don't know if you remember the one girl that, came she was taking notes i was just on the cusp of getting them interested in jazz and then you know and then we're out of school for the rest of the year and they're talking about remote next year so you know, I, I, I think th middle school oh, sorry no no i'm sorry go ahead i just think middle school is an age where this is my 19th year teaching middle school <laughs> is an is an age where kids will pick up and find their love and I see the opportunity for some of these students. And I can, I can tell if we were in school, things would be different, but I'm not sure how to inspire them through a webcam. Well, I love Zoom meetings, but they don't. You know, I, I think first, make sure you get your technical set up right. Like with all your light and all of that, make sure you got all your technical stuff right. And then I think the stuff you know about teaching, like all those years you've been teaching, it's because you love kids. In middle school, that's the hardest age group to teach, I find. Because they, they're just coming into their sexuality. They have all these things to exploit them at that time. And if you teach, you know, kids from first to seventh, when you get to that seventh, eighth, ninth grade, whew. But I feel that if, 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 if I were you, I feel like you should just act like we never had anything before this. And this is all we have. And you, you were raised teaching through this medium. You would do all kinds of stuff. Like I'm talking to this screen. I'm, I'm looking at a cell phone. I, it's, it's some of the, when I was growing up, we couldn't even imagine you would have a phone. That's only, only they only had that on Star Trek or the Jetsons or something. But I swear, I feel like I'm talking to you. And your emotion is coming true to me. Like you say, you're frustrated. It's, it goes back to what Emmanuel was saying about he's listening to these records with his boys. They're passing it back and forth, his friends. So they, some of, they might not all be boys, but he's listening to it. And it's like, the music has a, as an effect. So I think first you have to turn your voltage up. It's like if we do a if we do a recording on cell phones, which we're doing every week, we discovered that we have to play with a lot more intensity and softer because the cell phone can't take that volume. The great Hurlin Riley drummer was telling me just today he was playing something on the bass drum. 
He said, I got, I got to lighten up off that bass drum and play with a more di- with more intention. So I think you start to pick your wattage up with them and you just got to move through your course. I also think it's important through this medium to be much more organized with your time. If it's 45 minutes, if it's an hour, plot your time out. And that doesn't mean write everything out, but I would anchor my times with pieces of music. And some music would be listening, some would be call and response, and one thing would be the difficult teaching. I would teach the most difficult thing in the first section. The second section, I would have call and response, because that's when you start to lose them and they get bored. Mm-hmm. And the third section would be, y'all got to listen to some music, because uh, that, that's, a, that's a thing that's very important. And I think, I think you know, if you just that level of organization and keep your thing moving, I think you're going to see some success. And you know, if you need, if you need, you can also get people online. If you want me to get on with your class or something, I'm gonna give you my information. I would love to call them and clown with them. That's the other thing. I'm just going to schools. You know, you know, I love your kids, so I'm I'm happy to do it. That would be awesome. Thank you so much. Okay, maybe somebody else has a has a thought who has not talked. Um, Sean, you want to talk about this one? Yeah, I mean, when when I was when I was in eighth grade, that's when I started playing. So I, I guess I was 13. Uh, so the fact that they're even starting to learn about this music at, at such a young age, like fifth grade, and is 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 amazing to me because the only thing I was concerned about when I was in fifth grade is hooping and and and, and girls and sports and, and all the other things that the community that I was raised in cared about. And uh, but I I was fortunate enough to to have a grandmother that played Duke Ellington records around the house, and I would just piggyback on what what Winton said about how important listening is. And the and and also what Alexis said about how the music speaks for itself. I I can't imagine somebody listening to Duke Ellington for a sustained period of t- of time and not not enjoying it. I would I would I would imagine that that listening is 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 very important. And if you continue to to put the music into your students' ear, it will definitely resonate. Thank you. And and you know they're gonna know you love them. Like even though we on this on this phone call, I love all the kids that's on this call. I love Sean, right? And it's not, it's not like the kind of thing where I'm up on top of them with O'Reilly. I, I love them in a way you got to love, like your, your family members, they're going to do what they want to do. And they're going to feel that love come from, because I remember now when your class was in there. And, they, and they, you know, I know you get frustrated, but they, they, they feel you. Turn your watts up. All right. Thank you, Jennifer. Thanks so much. Thank you. All right, we've got just time for one more, but I think we can squeeze one more in here at the end. Um, Before we get to that, just want to remind everybody about all the live events we're continuing to host, question and answer sessions, master classes, um, live performances, um, and that we also premiered our gala concert in April. It's called the Worldwide Concert for Our Culture, and it can be found on YouTube, Facebook, and at jazz.org slash gala2020. So check all of those things out if you haven't. Um, and our last question is coming from uh, Chris Deffendorf. Chris. Oh, I'm so honored. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Well, first of all, Mr. Marsalis, um, my condolences um, on your recent loss. I saw you in 1989. I'm a bass player. I'm a composer, um, primarily a composer. And uh, I've been playing bass since 1984. but I did a transcription when I was at Berkeley uh, in 1989 of Quincy Jones's We Be Doing It. And at the time, I was very influenced by, I was very influenced by your thoughts uh, a couple years previous about how um, electronic music would take away uh, jobs such as sampling keyboards and stuff. So I was a DJ before. Um, before I was, uh, before I was a bassist, I was a DJ since 82. My father was a DJ. So I was a guy with a sound system. So around 2009, I just got interested in starting my own civics thing. And, and I'm really kind of glad that Skane's Domain has turned into this sort of different thing that I, that I expected. Uh, the brotherhood and the brother, the brotherly love in that sense, sisterly love, you know, in that sense. Uh, and so I poured everything into my art. I just, I just did it. And a lot of, I followed a song and later recognized by Cornell. Just, I didn't go there. They just discovered my art and they put me in a, 
I'm in with Shakespeare and stuff. So I'm trying to find my old voice with the turntables. I, I scratch, but um, I can I can scratch any so I can I can play. I heard a couple. I've been listening to Skane's domain. I'm sorry, I, I I missed the last couple. I didn't realize that this was a weekly thing until like the second week. But um, what I was going to say is that um, I'm finding my sound, but I'm just really wanting to know Mr. Marsalis's, you know, words because the music is a gift that I have, and my whole my whole inspiration is just to show people how they can be, you know, I can like download my creativity through my art. So uh, my friend Rita says, you know, I like your bass playing better than your, than your scratching. So I, I, I don't know if, that'll, if I'll ever be able to change that, but I have things that I can and, and I love it. You know, I can also scat while I, while I uh, scratch a melody. So it's an instrument that you can play a million different infinite tones, but of course, the thing is to find your sound. So uh, I'm trying to hone in. I've been uh, just had a lesson with a, a, someone doing some scat. I'm just finding that the song is everything, and the song just leads me to this. So I I, I feel like it's my way of giving back, and not giving back, but you know, honoring my father who was a DJ and you know, and, and also I was inspired by hip hop. And then it turns out when a friend of mine mailed me this transcription of Quincy Jones that I had notated this turntable arrangement. And then, so I was literally trying to be revolutionary in like 1989 and I turned out to be that. I had met John Cage, I'm gonna sum it up, but I had met John Cage a couple, <laughs> six months before. And uh, so I had the turntables and, as a thing, but I'm trying to make, I'm, I'm trying to make a, make a difference musically. You know, I'm trying to hone in on my sound, I'm trying to learn everything I can. I'm more in the, the pentatonic, as you had described in, in, in the previous thing, as I was going to say. You know, I, I know you can only play what you hear. So I'm going to hope to listen to your voice now. Man, you, covered, you covered so much ground with all that knowledge. And that, that stuff is beyond what I know. I got to turn that over to Emmanuel. You sound like <laughs> you, you, you're, in his, you're in Emmanuel's wheelhouse, man. I can't. I, don't, I can't mess that up. You summarize all of what you're trying to do. And I think, uh, I don't know as much about turntables as, I'm a, also, I don't know Joe Block. I, I, who are we? We've not Joe, we've not heard from him, Jacob and Emmanuel. So maybe we go one, two, three like that. Joe? Okay, yeah. I mean, yeah, you mentioned how your friend or, or somebody was recognizing <laughs> your DJing or your something more than your bass playing. It's always interesting to like, compare how you view yourself with how others <laughs> others view you. I mean, just thinking about how like Winton introduced me, you know, like when I first met Winton, I was, you know, thinking about Steve Coleman's music and we I did this program in high school with Emmanuel. We were studying all this odd meter. Um, so that's that was the first interaction I had with Winton, but that's not something that I think necessarily defines my music. So, you know, it's always interesting to hear, you know, to compare that. Similarly, like, you know, I think of myself you know, as a composer and a pianist, and you know, some people might think think of think of me more as either of those. So it's it's always interesting to like you know, take a step back and get a get a perspective um, that isn't always so self interested. You know, get get a lot of different different opinions to help to help uh, craft your identity. What you saying, Jacob? Yeah, yeah. So. So I've always been uh, uh, someone who's tried to remain as versatile as I can. Uh, I know you mentioned you, you play bass and, and you, you spin the discs, you scratch the discs. Um, and, and so for me personally, I've always tried to, you know, maintain all the sides of my playing. I know Alexa plays literally every woodwind instrument there is. Um, and so if you, can, if you can just do whatever it takes to be a complete yeah. artist and a complete human, whether yeah, that... Yeah, I hear what you're saying. Um, also... Uh, you know, like like me personally, trying to take a deeper dive into politics or, or or to read up on different things. I appreciate what you're doing. You know, with that versatility between bass and uh, and spinning the discs, and uh, just keep it up. Thank you. Right. What you what you saying, Emmanuel? Hold on, I've got him. He's muted. There we go. There you go. Go ahead, man. Yeah. Um. 
one one thing that uh, I've, I've been kind of dealing with. Uh, well, so I, I'll I'll tell you how how I got there. Um, basically, if if we're talking about electronics, that's been that's been the first thing we've had to deal with, right? Uh, during this virus, is I'm I'm playing keyboards. I'm no no longer playing a piano. You know what I mean? Like when I'm when I'm you know making tracks for myself or or whatever. You know I can't record piano parts. I'm recording keyboard parts. I'm dealing with MIDI cables and stuff right. like that. So uh, I'm already kind of, you know, by virtue of what's going on, having to deal with the electric side of things. But then uh, I thought about like, wh what does it mean to take that a step further? What is like uh, kind of something that I, I've been uh, doing recently is flipping through these, um, these flashcards by Brian Eno. He has some flashcards called uh, Oblique Productivity. And what it does is it gives you um, a kind of little like uh, like little phrases that help help you to kind of think outside of the box and uh, can help with creativity in a way. Um, and one one that one one of them that I flipped to uh, the other day was cross the line. And uh, so I've been kind of trying to figure out how I can like what does it mean to cross the line? Like when we're playing, we all know where the line is. You know what I mean? Whether it be and and the line is different for everybody, right? Whether it be playing outside of the changes, playing inside of the changes, playing out of time, playing inside of time, and then and, you know, of course, we can get more uh, abstract than that. But like, so I've been kind of feel, like trying to figure out uh, conceptually what does it mean to cross the line when I'm playing, and how can I live on the other side of the line? You know, uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm still trying to figure out what that means. It may be extra musical, you know. Right. Uh, I don't know. Great. Cool. So I want to, I want to, I want to thank you. Thank. I want to thank all my 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 panelists, of course. I uh, love them, my man. I'm. A, I want to tell. I want to commend you on your leisure suit. I haven't seen one of those in a long time, and I like the sand dunes you had behind you. <laughs> I don't. I don't know where you were, but I. You know, it put us in the mood. I. So I just want to say uh, thank thank you to all of you for joining us tonight. It was it was certainly a pleasure for me to uh to to see my younger people and hear what they're saying. And uh, we're gonna see y'all again next week. And uh, just love to everybody till we meet again. I'm gonna turn you back over to Adam and his capable hands. Riley. Thank Joe, you everybody. Alexa, Sean, Thank you. Cosimo, Jacob, Emmanuel, all of us. All right, thanks everybody. Um, that, that's a wrap on tonight. I'll just, I'll just remind everybody, um, we're a nonprofit organization in New York City. Um, if it's within your means, please consider making a donation. We're so grateful for any support. Um, and with that, um, we'll call it a wrap. I just want to say thanks for everybody who joined and participated. And uh, we'll see you again soon. Take care, guys. <laughs>